okay, babe, this new title might be a bit easy to understand. Yeah, well. But if you jump into a pool without being able to see the bottom, that's what we're doing with our buildings all the time. You see, in civil engineering, we need to know what materials we're working with. And while we know the strength of the walls and thickness of the columns, we don't know what lies in the soil beneath our feet. The reason for this is spatial variability, where properties change with distance. It can happen on a large scale, but also on a small scale as well. That means if we do a test, say, here versus here, the results can look completely different, which means we need to investigate the ground thoroughly and cleverly. Now, if you look around, our buildings might look okay, they're not falling down, and that's true. But you see, testing is expensive, and so the fact is we're not testing enough, which means three things are happening. Yeah, and unfortunately there is no optimal investigation guideline of any kind. There are no recommendations on how to actually investigate the ground, <laughs> which is probably a bit of a problem. Mm. Now, one of the problems that can result from this is foundation under design, where our foundations are too weak. Basically, it can result in structural damage or even complete collapse. And the fact is, if you see a crack anywhere on a road, bridge, building, house, anywhere at all, the chances are it's probably due to a problem in the ground. A problem that we can solve through sufficient testing. Another problem is unexpected conditions. So if you don't test the ground enough, and yet you, you find that the ground is different to what you expect, this can result in large delays, which is itself bad enough. But in large projects, you can see that you can spend a million dollars a day just maintaining the site, let alone actually building it. So this can be a big deal. And even then, when everything goes okay, there's no cracks, there's no delays, and our buildings don't fall down, the chances are it's because of foundation over-design, where your foundations are too big and strong. <laughs> now, for foundations like this, it's a thousand cubic meters of concrete, a thousand cubic meters of CO2 have been produced. So through sufficient testing, if we minimize this foundation as best we can, we can save money and save the environment at the same time. Now, I've solved the problem through calculating, basically, the relationship between investigation effort and total cost. So if you know how much an investigation costs before you do it, you can simply choose the one that's cheapest overall and implement that. So, yeah, cheap. And I'll show you what the trade-offs are. Basically, if we're looking at the relationship, as the number of tests increase, the testing cost increases, as you expect, that makes sense. But at the same time, as you understand the ground to a better degree, the probability of failure, and hence the expected cost of repairing that failure, decreases. <coughs> so it certainly is a trade-off there. And if we combine our costs together, there is very clearly an optimal number of tests, say, four boreholes in this case, that the engineer will know is the best investigation to do, which is absolutely fantastic. Now, I've solved the problem calculating these costs through a six-step process. The first is generating a virtual soil, as you see here, just like you'll find in real life. I'll talk about that a bit later. The next step is conducting our site investigations. And we can do hundreds of these, basically as many as you want, and we can see which of those is best. <coughs> so these green lines are simply the boreholes basically where you're testing the soil, just like where you test in real life. Once we have this information, we then create a soil model. Basically, this is what we think the soil looks like based <coughs> on our site investigation results. It's the idealized representation. And we use this model to build our foundations, to design them, figure out how big they are. And of course, we need to know whether the building cracks or not. So to do that, we put our foundation back in the original soil, and we can see how far the piles, the foundations sink into the ground using finite element analysis. So once we have done all this, we can easily calculate the costs of all our components, of testing, construction, and failure. And we can easily plot up what I showed you on the previous slide. Now, the problem is that every soil is different. That is the ultimate <coughs> challenge of this research. So to solve this problem, you repeat the process thousands of times for each type of soil, and you look at the average costs. So if you have a soil that roughly matches this description, sometimes investigation might be a bit better, sometimes a bit worse, well, but on average, it will be the best investigation you can do. And there was no guideline before that point in time. 
Now, in terms of virtual soils, here's a variety of single layer soils like you see here. Relatively simple, but you have to start somewhere. And they're generated through basically, as you see, a random number generator that produces volumes of correlated soil properties. Now, what do I mean by correlated? Basically, if you look at the soil here, and a little bit further away, the property is going to be fairly similar. But the further and further away you go, the more different it's likely to be. So this correlation reflects the property that soils that are closer together tend to be more similar, just like you'd expect in real life. And an engineer only has to match their site to one of these categories to find out which investigation they need to do based on the recommendations. So let's look at one example of my results of two different types of common tests in civil engineering. One that's cheap and inaccurate, one that's expensive but relatively accurate. And if you pop them both up, immediately there are two conclusions. The first is that the more accurate test actually performs better. It actually saves you money despite being more expensive. And the second observation is that you can save up to $1.8 million by doing, say, 16 boreholes instead of one. So we just process that for a second. You're doing a larger initial investment, and yet you're actually resulting in a net savings of $1.8 million. What's well, not to love about that? So, charts like this are basically the product of my research. A series of charts for different kinds of soils, different kinds of tests, and so on. And so, an engineer can do two useful things with this chart. The first is know how many boreholes is actually best. Right? So far, so good. But the problem is clients like to minimize costs. So they might want to do something more like four boreholes, which as you can see, isn't as good. So the engineer can then show the client this chart and say, well, hold on. If you spend another $10,000, $20,000 or so, you can actually save about $100,000. So this will help persuade the client to save the client some money, while at the same time reducing risk, which is absolutely fantastic. So, to summarise my points, there will finally be a soil testing guideline where there was no guideline before when I finished my research. We'll also be able to save hundreds of millions of dollars all around the world every year. At the same time, we'll be reducing CO2 emissions because concrete produces quite a lot of that in case you weren't aware. And of course, you'll have more reliability in the buildings because the soil is understood better which means less cracking and more safety in all of our infrastructure that lies on or in the ground, which is basically everything. So essentially, we'll have less of this and a little bit more of this. <laughs>